Okay, so we're going to continue with chem, um, thermal chem notes. So what I would like you to do is grab out your notes if you haven't already. We should have done most of E last time. Did we do all of E last time on page two? All this side? Okay, so we're going to flip over and, and talk about this really quick on this side, just sort of as a review to help those that were a little confused for the quiz understand things. So I am going to zoom in on this graph, but know that we're answering these questions over here. Okay? So what we want to do here is the first question it asks is, what is the enthalpy of the reactants? That's the distance from here to here. That's A. So what is that distance? No. That's a potential energy. So if it asks for the enthalpy of the reactants, it's basically asking, another word for that would be potential energy. Oh. Okay, so when it asks for the enthalpy or potential energy, what would that be? What is A? 20. 20. And what would the unit be? Uh, okay. Kilojoule per mole. <laughs> okay. Now the next part is, what is the enthalpy of the products? So that's where I come over here, because this is my products, and that would be B, all the way to the bottom. This is my reactants. This is my products. Okay, so what would B be? What would the enthalpy of the products? That would be, fit, that would be 80. Oh, is it 50? I can't read that. It's 50. <laughs> it looks... It, that's, you can tell your eyes are going bad when eight, fives look like eights. Okay, so it's 50. And then I ask for delta H. Delta H is the difference between the products and the reactants. So this is number C. Okay, so what's number C going to be? Or letter C. 50 minus 20 is 30. So that's going to be 30. So put the answer there so you can keep track of what it is. And then the other one asks if it's endo or exothermic. Yes? It's endothermic. That is right. Okay, and the other thing I'm just going to, the, I already gave you the ad, activated complex at the top. There are three dotted lines on this. I would make sure that I put three dotted lines on a graph if I'm given a graph so I can find things. The other thing that we would want to find is the activation energy. That's from the top of the activated complex to where the reactants are. That is E of A, which is equal to the activation energy energy. That's the energy it takes for the boy to get up the courage to go across the room and say hello to the girl we talked about last time. Okay? Now, if you know most of, if you know most of this, then you basically got what you need, right? Because that was what was on the quiz, basically. You basically got what you need. Now, you do need to pay attention to the units over here on the side. Okay? This reaction pathway is just the path of the whole reaction, okay? All right, so let's look at this next little part here, specific heat. Um, by definition, specific heat is when you take one gram of any substance and raise it one degree Celsius, it's um, how much energy it's used. So usually specific heat is given in gram, let's try that again, in joules divided by gram degrees Celsius. So joules are how we measure energy. Gram degrees Celsius means it's per gram per degree Celsius. So how many gram, how much do I need energy do I need to put in to raise one gram of iron, one gram of aluminum, or one gram of whatever I have, one degree Celsius. That's what specific heat is. We're going to talk about the equation here in just a minute. But I want to go down here to these two right here. Now, I gave you a lot of extra space so that you could take notes on this next part that we're doing. So negative Q is basically saying negative delta H. So if I put it like that, what does that mean? We've talked about, de about delta H. Yes? That means it's exothermic. And I'm going to go out a little bit so you can have see more room. And Rxn means reaction, or that it gives off heat. And I went off the side. There you go. Okay, so what would a positive Q equal? Positive delta H. What does delta stand for anyway? Change. Good. 
So positive delta H would be what type of reaction? Endothermic. Great. It takes in heat. Good. Those are the ones that feel cold. So this one takes in heat. And it feels cold. So the other one feels hot. And temperature would go up here and temperature would go down here. Okay? All right, so we're going to talk about these a little bit more in a PowerPoint that I've got behind here. Calories and specific heat, or calorimeters and specific heat. So we've been working with thermodynamics. In thermodynamics, we've been basically doing temperature. Temperature is our way to measure what's changing because we can't really see it, but we can measure it with, with temperature. We've done two labs now with that, measuring temperature. Heat. What is heat? You guys are looking at me strange. It's energy. And so what would the units of heat be? Joules. Yes. OK, so and then we're going to perform some specific heat problems. So temperature, we usually use Celsius or, or Kelvin. Yes, you can use Fahrenheit, but for when we do science, we use Celsius or Kelvin. Why do I have two scales for science? Just because, OK. What's the absolute zero scale? Kelvin, what does it mean, an absolute zero scale? If I hit zero at Kelvin, then all motion stops. Okay, we haven't reached that. So the special thing about Kelvin is that when I put it in math equations, there's no zeros and there's no negatives. So it's nice to have that scale where I only have positive numbers. Okay, the Celsius and Kelvin scales are divided the same. So it's like they all have the same divisions. The only difference is Kelvin is not negative or zero. So if I take the difference in a Kelvin temperature and the difference in a Celsius temperature, they're going to be the same. Okay? Because, because the, the dividings are the same. So I divide them the same. Okay? So heat is Q or H, delta H, okay? And we know just from experience, if I have something hot and I put it on a table or in my hand, what's going to happen? The heat's going to go to the side that is cold, right? The cold's not going to go up. The hot is going to make the cold warmer. Does that make sense? The heat's going to transfer from the hot to the cold. Okay. We used the uh, units of heat, 1,000 joules to 1 kilojoule, yet last time with the lab that we did, because we had to have it in kilojoules. That's something we need to know. We're going to be using kilometers today, um, and they help measure heat flow and direction. So this is sort of looking at a Venn diagram, and it didn't finish it for me. But this right here in between is where energy is. So this area right here is where heat and temperature overlap in a Venn diagram. OK. Oh, there's my energy. All right. Um, other energy units. Now, this is sort of important, so you might want to write this down somewhere on your notes. One joule, what is a joule? Well, a joule is a kilogram times meter squared divided by second squared. OK, so what? You probably have heard of calories. Well, a lab calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. That's not the calories that you find on your cereal box, about your cereal or any other food you eat. What those are are nutritional calories, and they're actually 1,000 lab calories. So if something says 120 calories, it's actually 1,000 times that. But that would get really messy on the side of a cereal box. So they just said, basically, we're going to call them kilocalories. Because the body needs a lot of calories to move and do what it needs to do. Everybody got that? Anybody need me to wait? OK. This one is also, this is the equation that you need to write down. This is the equation we did last time in lab. I just gave it to you. But it's Q equals MCP delta T. And remember that Q could also be stated as delta H. Okay? Q 
Q is the heat. The units are J and KJ. M is mass, grams or kilograms. And delta T is a change in temperature, final minus initial. It could be Celsius or it could be Kelvin. It doesn't matter, okay, because the difference in that temperature is going to be the same. Jake, are you writing the equation down with the definition? Okay, the specific heat, Cp, is how much energy it takes to raise something one gram, so, uh, one gram of something one degree Celsius. Okay, so let me know when you've got that written down. This is your notes. You have to get the other notes from somebody. Got a few more that are still writing stuff. And I have all your eyeballs. I know that we're good to go. So we just used this last time just to melt ice. And we found out the heat of fusion of ice. That was pretty easy. Today we're going to be working with metals, so we're going to be doing a little bit more than we did last time. Are we okay to go ahead? Okay. All right, the one that we used last time was a specific heat of water. This is something you will need to have memorized. So what does it look like? It looks like how many calories, right? The joule number, that's the calorie number. So make sure you remember that. 4.184 joules divided by gram degree Celsius, that's water. That's one you'll need to know. I would write it somewhere. That's a specific heat, or the CP of water. I had you write that on your lab, too. Remember that? Okay, every substance has its own specific heat. Okay, so we can identify substances by their specific heat. We're going to be using a simple calorimeter, but there's several different kinds. I wanted to show you the different kinds. There's what's a foam cup calorimeter. That's the, fa um, that's the Utah version. They, other places call them coffee cup calorimeters, okay? Um, bomb calorimeters are the other one. When we do nutritional calories, they use a bomb calorimeter, okay? And we'll talk about how. So this is a coffee cup calorimeter or foam cup calorimeter. We're, we're going to even simplify this a little bit more because we're going to do it quickly. We're not going to wait for very long for the temperature to come up. We're, we're going to use our temperature and stirring rod in one as we use our digital thermometers. We're going to just have a styrofoam cup, not in a beaker, and we're not going to put t another one over the top because it raises the temperature so fast, by the time you got it over the top, it wouldn't be worth it. Okay, so we're doing a really simple one. Now, if the temperature goes up, it's exothermic. If the temperature goes down, it's endothermic. We did those earlier with the different chemicals we were mixing, but this time we're doing it with metal. This is what is known as a bomb calorimeter. So if I want to find the, how many calories are in a potato chip, they would put a potato chip in here, seal the container, put the container in here, and electronically ignite it. It would give off heat. The heat would be absorbed by the water. They use a little stirring rod. They see how much the water temperature goes up, and then they're able to calculate how many calories were given off by the potato chip. That's sort of what we're going to do today, but we're just going to use metals. We don't have this fancy bomb calorimeter. Okay, but we're going to use the same kind of system, and I'll show you here in a minute. So, exothermic again, temperature rises, endothermic, temperature um, goes down. This is what we did last time. We basically found out how much um, heat was required to raise the temperature, or lower the temperature of something. So, here was our Q. Here was our mass. Here was our change in temperature, and we would just plugged it in. I gave you the CP. We just plugged it in and we got Q. Then we divided our Q by 1,000 to get kilojoules. Remember that part of the lab that we did last time? Okay. If I have an unknown substance, I can also do that and try and figure out what the specific heat is for an unknown substance if I know how much energy it took to raise it to a specific temperature. 
I can plug in and I can actually find out what the CP of an unknown substance is. Then I look at the literature values and I compare them and I find out, okay, that is actually mercury. Okay, so I can identify unknown substances. How this works is whatever lost heat, something had to gain it. I can't lose energy. Okay, because of that, when the ice took in the energy from the water, temperature lowered of the water, and we were able to see how much energy was transferred. Okay? If heat's released, it's exothermic, temperature rises. If it um, absorbs heat, then temperature decreases and it's endothermic. So this is the lab we're going to do today. So as you go back in lab, you're going to pick up the easy link, the temperature probe, and the calculator. You're going to get your goggles and your apron on. Okay? You're going to connect the easy link to the temperature probe first and then connect it to the TI. And you can do this anywhere along the, um, along the road. But remember, it has to go in that order. I just wanted to remind you. It will automatically turn the calculator on and give you the temperature. So when you get back there, the first thing that you want to do is turn on your hot plate. I already did that for you, so it should be nice and ready to go. Okay? You'll have a set of metals. Um, you got tin, and this is not in the right order, so I'm going to have to tell you what they are. Tin, steel, zinc, copper, and aluminum. Copper and aluminum are in the right place. If you look at it here down at the bottom, you'll see that this is tin. Tin has sort of a yellow look to it, a yellow silver. So it's pretty easy to, to see, and it's very shiny compared to the others. Steel is short. These two sort of look alike, but when you're looking at the one on the far right, <clears throat> it actually has more of a blue tint, that's zinc. But if you did, can't tell, because they, they've got some oxidation on the outside of them, put them next to each other, zinc's taller. Okay? So that's pretty easy to remember. In the lid, they have the diagram here. You're going to want to choose two metals. I don't care which two. Okay? Choose two metals. Make sure you write down the two metals specific heat on the literature value. So if you're looking at your, your lab on the back, there's a side that the left side is data, the right side is more calculations. On the right side in the table, it says literature value. See it? You're going to make sure you write down the literature value there. These, num these little lines here are just lines. They're not negatives. Okay? So this is not a negative. It's just a line saying that's what it is. So you're going to write down the identity and the literature value. In lab, we're going to try and figure out what the value is experimentally. Okay? So, while that's heating, what you're going to do is weigh each of the metals. Then quickly, using tongs, put them into the water. The water should be boiling. Okay? It needs to be in the boiling water about two minutes so the metal will come up to temperature. Okay? You're going to do that for both of them. Be very careful putting them in because if you drop them, we lose beakers. So be really careful. Okay? Uh, these are about $10 a piece. We don't want to spend a lot of money. We've already lost a few. You're going to get the temperature after the two minutes of the rolling boil. You want it to be rolling boil. I didn't take it when it was rolling boiling. That sounded really weird. Rolling boiling. Um, but you, that's when you want to take the temperature. Once you do that, you're going to put the probe in ice, bring it back down to room temperature. Okay? Wipe it off with a paper towel. In the meantime, while your metals are heating up, okay, you're going to take a styrofoam cup. You're going to weigh the cup. You're going to pour water into it about 100 grams. You're going to write that down, and then you're subtract them and find out exactly how much you put in. So it needs to be about 100 grams. You're going to take the temperature of this water. It all needs to be distilled water. Okay? Take the temperature of this water. This was to remind you to take the temperature before you move the metals. Then you're going to take and move one of the metals into the styrofoam cup. And you're going to have the temperature probe in there, and you're going to stir the temperature probe, use it as a stir, stir the temperature probe so that the temperature or the water goes around the metal and gets to the hottest point it can. You're going to record that. So you record it before, you record it after. Okay? Then to do your second one, you take this temperature, whatever it was right here, 
and that's the beginning temperature for the next one you're going to move. Then you move the next one. You don't have to do the, the thing here because you're not checking the temperature again because I've got it boiling for you. Other, other classes we had to because we didn't have enough time to get it boiling. You're going to move the other one while it's in with the other metal. So I didn't take the other metal out. I'm still stirring. I get the hottest temperature they both go to, or it goes to again, and put that as my final temperature. At this point, I clean everything up. I've got everything I need back in lab. Clean everything up, put it away, get a stamp, because remember, the stamp cost is 10 points to you. Come back in here, and we'll start doing calculations. Okay? Questions? Okay, goggles, aprons, we'll meet you back in lab. Oh, wait, stop. Actually, no.